All right, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and our text for today is verse 16. A very short verse. Rejoice forevermore. Rejoice forevermore. Well, Apostle Paul has taught us in the preceding verses our God-given duty toward one another. He has taught us what we should do in our interpersonal relations within the church and in the wider community of our society. Well, Christians have unique responsibilities, isn't it? We can't behave like the rest of the world. We follow the Lord Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the manual for earthly living as Christians, which is the Bible. And we therefore cannot live a life that is not guided. I mean guided by God. You can't do what you want to do because if you do what you want to do, you will end up sinning and offending God. Sinning against God. Because our minds are corrupt. Our thoughts are often influenced by our lustful passions. And the devil himself never leave us alone. And the world which is on the side of the devil, filled with humanistic, ungodly principles, often influence us to think the way it wants to, wants us to live. And that makes us really ungodly. So what makes us godly in all our con uh, relationships, in our choices, in our conduct, is our submission to divine guidance. And so, in the last chapter of this episode that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, he pays much attention to guide the church in Thessalonica how to live, because many of them are new Christians at that point of time, maybe a couple of years at the most. And um, they, they, they came from worldly behavior and conduct and culture. It was a terribly hedonistic society. And so the mannerism had to be changed because they're Christians. They're no more non-Christians. They're no more part of the world. They are taken out of the world, even though in the world, they are taken out of the world in the sense that they are not to follow the worldly ideas. So Apostle Paul had told them that at all times, in all matters of mutual dealings, they are to be guided by divine counsels. And I'm not going back to talk about it. We, we were told about how we should behave in the church and comforting ourselves together, edifying one another and, and beseeching one another to labor and to respect those who are above you in the church and to esteem them very highly and so on. And now, from verse 16 to verse 20, or rather 22, 16 to 22, Apostle Paul turns his attention to spiritual duties of believers. In the previous section, it was more about the mutual duties to each one of us have with another. Now it is about our duty before God, you and God. Before that, he talked about you and others in the church or in the society. Now about you and your God. Well, in verse 16, you are commanded, which we are going to study today, to rejoice. And this, the source of this joy is God. In fact, this joy that Apostle Paul talks about is the fruit of your relationship with God. It's not the joy that you feel emotionally when you sing a song or when you dance or you drink something or eat something that you like. This is an abiding joy, a consistent, constant, never diminishing, ever 
abiding, ever growing, ever abundant joy. And that is only in God. All of the things weakens with time. Only the things that are in God remains constant all the time. And so this duty is actually a call toward God. And to remain always connected with Him. To be in Him. And then you have verse 17 and 18 teaching you what you should do toward God. Pray to Him and give thanks to Him. These are your spiritual duties. We will study that, God willing, in the coming weeks. Then in verses 19, 20, we are told how we should conduct ourselves in relationship to His Word, our duty toward His Word. The Spirit of God is given to us to remind us His will, so quench not the Spirit. And in the next verse, we are told, despise not prophesyings. That means whatever being preached by God's appointed servants, don't deny them. And we will study them. So those things has to do with your relationship with God, God's Spirit, and God's Word. So here we have individual responsibilities that we must always maintain. Always maintain. Not occasionally. Not now and then. Not once in a week when you come to church. Always. And in the last two verses, namely 21 and 22, where duties are mentioned, he talks about your sanctification. Personal sanctification. The need to live a separated life in this wicked world. Because it says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Don't accept everything as it is. Hey, test everyone. Test everything. Then only that which is good you adhere to. And then the verse that we memorized a while ago in verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. So we have to be separated to live a holy life. And we will go through all of these, God willing, in coming weeks. But today, we shall consider our spiritual duty in the Lord of rejoicing evermore. Rejoicing evermore. There are only two words in the Greek text, the original letter that Paul wrote. Pantote. Kerete, very easy to memorize, right? Try and memorize an in Greek phrase. Pantote, kerete, very easy. <laughs> Pantote means always. Interestingly, always comes before rejoice. I will tell you why. So if I give you a very literal word for word translation, it will sound like always you be rejoicing, or always you rejoice. The emphasis is on always, not occasionally. And that is something that most of us are unfamiliar with. We know we need to rejoice and occasionally we enjoy the presence of God and presence of God's people, but do we have a consistent constant, ever-blooming joy that is unaffected by situations and circumstances. Well, this is not the first time Apostle Paul referred to the subject of joy. He already mentioned that. Let's have a quick look. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. We covered this many months ago. Let's return to it very quickly. At least make some reference to refresh our mind. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul said, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost. You look at that. A few things precedes the statement about the joy that the believers had. First, they became followers of Apostles who were God's servants and the Lord. So they were following the Lord and the company of God's saints. You see, that 
is the basis for the joy that came to their heart. They were ardent followers, not occasional followers. Their hearts were knitted with the company of the Lord and his people. In other words, we can say they were truly members of the church, always following the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. There was this eagerness, even when they are not in the church, to behave like a church person in the presence of God. You know, for Christians, no matter where we are, we live in the presence of God. So we can't for, go into areas that are not godly because the Lord is not there. We are followers of Christ, not followers of evil things, not followers of the world, not followers of Hollywood stars or soccer stars. Well, I'm not saying you can't have a look at them or you can't even hear, hear the voice, but we don't allow them to influence us. We are not molded by their thinking. We are not molded by their ideas. We are not molded by their fashion. We are influenced, guided, led by our Savior and by the company of the saints. We want to behave like godly people. You know, if you were living at the time when Paul wrote this, you would be saying, I want to be like Apostle Paul. Hey, that's a big statement. You know what does that mean? That Paul was so, so zealous for the Lord, he got beaten up. He got kicked around. Often he was left in street corners to die. He was no hero. He was a hero in the mind of God's people. But he was no hero in his time. He was hated. Not he was a terrorist. Not because he is an extremist. Not because he caused trouble. But because he followed Jesus. They hated the Lord Jesus. So to be a follower of Apostle Paul, you know what? Is to be afflicted. Read the next part of that verse. What does it say? Having received the word with much affliction. So when Apostle Paul preached, they attentively listened to him and made sure their life is molded by what is being preached, which resulted in hatred, persecution, and what the word here is affliction. But... It didn't affect them. Yes, there was pain in the body. There were, there, were, there were much difficulty in relating to unbelieving parents and relatives. They couldn't have free movement in the society without people making a comment about them or gossiping about them or laughing in a scornful manner. Everywhere people tried to put them to shame. Officers were after them, chasing them. Now, there's a big hoo-ha going on in the United States that uh, their, their internal revenue department was chasing or being rude or difficult toward the conservative groups in, this, in, the, in the land. And they are making a big fuss about it. <laughs> At that time, poor Christians could not make any fuss about it. Nobody is going to tell the king, hey, sir, your department is... Quite, un quite, quite unkind to the Christians. Actually, the king would say, you have something to complain about this. Uh, put him in the prison. <laughs> if you ever were to complain about the sufferings of Christian, you will suffer even more. That was the kind of situation. So there was hostility. There was deliberate attempt to affect the joy of the people, to unsettle them so they would leave the faith. But mm -hmm, those things didn't affect them. But it only produced what? More joy. So you ended up reading in that verse, with joy of the Holy Ghost. You see, the joy is a result of the Holy Ghost working in your heart. We will talk about it later. Now when you come to the next chapter, these are the things we learn about the joy. It is about the hope that we have in the coming of Christ. First, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. Paul spoke about the joy in the believers 
at the coming of the Lord. He was a wonderful pastor who loved the church and he knew the church is not for a few months or a few years. It's not about having a big building and take great glory about the building they built. It's about the assurance that these people are going to be in heaven. You know, I'm glad you came. I said this many times, but let me tell you again, in case you missed it or it never got into your head. You came here. You probably have given a good sum of money into the offering bag. Actually, I don't want to know anything about these things. But I just want to know you will be there when the Lord comes. Whether it's today or tomorrow or 10 years down the line. Your coming means nothing. When the Lord comes as a judge, you will not be with him in heaven. What is the church for? The church is to prepare people for the Lord's coming. And Paul says, you know, it doesn't matter, brothers, whether you're persecuted by the world. I don't bother about your standing in this world. I know you are a subdued, suffering people. There is nothing glamorous about you. You are not among the elite of the society. You are not among the rich in the world. You are not among the famous and the popular ones. You are among the despised. The church was a despised community. Church was like the scum of this world. People treated them like dung. But Paul says, but when I think about the fact that you suffer all this because you follow Christ, I'm looking forward to seeing you when Jesus comes. And on that day, you will be what? Our hope, our joy and crown of rejoicing. Joy and crown of rejoicing. And he went on to say in verse 20, for ye are our glory and joy. So you see, dear friends, something you must know. You are not only called to rejoice, but you are also called to be the reason for others' joy. Reason for your pastor's joy. Reason for Christians' joy. Not a misery and trouble to Christians. You and I are called to be a joy to other Christians. Because we give great hope of Christ's coming because we live in the light of Christ's coming and we urge others to get ready for Christ and we don't give any room for the world to flourish we reject the world we, we keep the world out of our life and we tell the world this is how we get ready for Christ and when Christians, truly born again Christians, and those who love the Lord in a, with a faithful heart, see how consecrated you are to God and separated you are from the world, their heart rejoices. Ah, here is a group that I can truly call strangers and pilgrims in this world. It's not that you sing, this world is not my home. You can have a beautiful home, voice. I'm just a passing through. <laughs> but at the end, yeah, you are passing through all the wickedness and you're not going to get to heaven. You only sing. There is no joy about your song. Would you turn to chapter 3, verse 9? He talks about the same truth right there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. For what thanks? Can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. There was great celebration in the heart of Paul and his team members, apostolic team members, when they think about the believers in Thessalonica. And he said, we burst into giving thanks to God because our hearts contain, cannot contain the joy that we have for your sakes. You know, they were not giving thanks because they got promotion. They were not giving thanks because the church members become millionaires. You know, today pastors say, hey, come to Jesus. You all become millionaires. And you, the more wealth you have, the more you are blessed. Rubbish. 
rubbish. Come to Jesus and suffer for him. I'm not saying God cannot give you money. Yes, God can. But money is no guarantee of anything. Jesus has given up everything as he himself said. Foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. For my name's sake, you have to give up on your relatives, your friends, your fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, even wives. And take up the cross and follow me. So there is nothing to be so proud about if you are somebody in the church. My joy, let me tell you, as the pastor of Gethsemane, got nothing to do with you are a big officer, or you are a multi-millionaire, or you are a popular singer. No! It only gives me more pain and agony thinking how you're going to be trapped by these things. But let me tell you, I take great joy when I see a poor brother. doesn't have to be a poor. It can be a rich brother also who doesn't, doesn't allow the things of this world to take his heart away from the things of God. What I see in churches today is that, oh, I'm busy because I'm on overseas trip. Uh, I cannot come. Maybe next year I will come and see you in the church. And when I think about him and see his Facebook post on Sunday, he is at the beach. How can I thank God? There are some flashy young people in the church. Look very extremely modern. The hair is Mount Everest kind. You know, and fiery and green and blue. Very, very, very fashionable. Wow! Shocked. Look at them, there is nothing godly about them. They come to church to show the fashion. But I'm worried if the Lord were to call you today with all your pikey hair and worldliness, where will you go? Where will you end up? Can I burst in joy when I think about you? Oh, what a brother. Praise God, this is a Christian. Undoubtedly, one who follow Christ. I tell you, actually, very few pastors, I mean, there are a lot of pastors, but very few godly pastors can rejoice over the congregations of our time. I think it is, it, now we have come to a time where people are, people should be saying, pastors, are weeping pastors, you know what I mean? Like Jeremiah, who wrote the book of Lamentation and is known among all Christians as a weeping prophet. Why? It's not because he has no message to preach. They didn't want him to preach what God told him to preach. They put him in a dungeon and lock him up there. They make him suffer for preaching God's word. You know, what happens today? Today is not that God failed to send faithful preachers. There are many good, solid, sound preachers. When I said many, I'm just saying that uh, there are. I'm not saying all pastors are. In fact, most of the pastors are false prophets today. Most of the pastors, I repeat, are false prophets. They are just being pastors to make money for themselves and live a comfortable life. They teach the Bible in a twisted way so they can entertain the people in the church. Not to rebuke their sins, not to get them ready for Christ's coming, but to help them to live more and more worldly in this world. Now, that is the biggest portion of modern pastors. But they're still, they're, even though we say a small group, that small group is not that small. It's small compared to the false ones, but still it is made up of, I believe, thousands of them everywhere in the world. But people don't want to hear them. They like to be seduced and deceived. So you see, pastors are yearning to find the joy in the church. Now, what am I trying to say? It's very hard for me to be so happy as a pastor by looking at my own flock because of the worldliness. Yes, I'm happy about some of you. But I cannot burst into thanksgiving when I pray, when I remember some of you. Tears and sighs. Can I really say about you? You ask about yourself. Don't think about the person next to you. Think about yourself. Can your pastor really bow his head before God and say, 
Thank you for this member of the church, Lord. How wonderful to see his life. Can I? You know, I'm basically saying this. I find it a great struggle. Find it a great struggle. So where is my joy then? Well, I can tell you something. I'm still told to rejoice. Maybe not in your sin. I can have extra joy if you also walk in the Lord. But if you are going the world's way, then I just have to forget you. And I've got to think about what is my real joy all about. And I'm going to wait for you. Jeremiah didn't wait for the sinning people. He had to follow God. And the members of this church can't be waiting for you until you turn. They've got to rejoice. That means they've got to put aside things that would dampen the spirit. Well, this is something that we need to see deeply. I must say <clears throat> that the divine command to rejoice is all over the Bible. It's not just a New Testament idea. There are hundreds of times in the Bible we are called to rejoice and to give thanks with joy of heart. I probably do not have time to go through all of those, but you can always go back home nowadays with computers and all these concordance within your mobile phones, I mean smartphones. You can do a quick check. How many times the word rejoice and joy appear? You'll be shocked to see that the Bible's one of the major themes is to rejoice. God doesn't want any of Christians, any of his people, to ever live in sadness and gloom and despondence. There must be joy. To the point that we are told in our catechism, the chief end of man is to enjoy him, to glorify him, of course, first, and then to Enjoy him forever. To enjoy God forever. In other words, it's telling you your joy cannot be always in people. Your joy cannot be in the things of this world. It's not about the song. It's not about the comfortable seat you sit on. It's not about the show on the stage. The joy of the church is God himself and his will, and his purposes. You know, churches today want to bring in the worldly things to entertain the people. And they say, oh, like the new Calvinism that is propagated by John Piper, Mark Driscoll, these are popular young stars of the internet Christianity, internet reform Christianity. They would say, the greatest thing is to rejoice. But they twist it and they say things like, God is most satisfied when, sorry, God is most pleased when you are most satisfied in him. Well, in a way it is a correct statement, but then, in order to make you look happy on church, uh, do, uh, uh, on a Sunday in church, they don't preach God and his truth, but they, also, they not only preach God and his truth, they also mix it with the world, with the worldly entertainment. So all the churches now have all kinds of stuff on the stage on Sunday. Rap, rock musicians, you know, all the musicians with all this chain and all kinds of appearance. And they sing in a way that is so contemporary and so worldly. When I said contemporary, what I mean is worldly. Nothing wrong about being contemporary if it is good. But they are so worldly. And they say, hey, happiness is everything, you know. We also t teach our children, right? Happiness is to know the Savior. That's a nice song. But today is slightly different. Happiness is to know the world and... Whatever. 
It's being worldly that makes people happy today. If it's a good preaching, they would tell you, ah, oh, boring. Too demanding. Too straight. They think there is something very special about hypocrisy. Appearing to be godly and not being worldly. No, there is nothing godly about it. You know what? The joy that the Bible speaks about is a pure joy. It is solely based on God. You remember Philippians 4.4? 4? If you don't remember, go there. Philippians 4.4. 4. We are all familiar with that text, I suppose. But let's read carefully what it says. You read on your own before I begin. Think about what it says. Where is your joy? Answer that question. Where is the joy? Why are you supposed to rejoice? Rejoice in the Lord, isn't it? And rejoice in the Lord always. There is no time you can move out of the Lord. Always in the Lord. So you can rejoice always. It's not rejoice in the Lord on Sundays. And then rejoice in the world other days. Very clearly. Rejoice in the Lord always. And not once is said. Immediately, Paul says, and again I say, rejoice. And then you look at the next verse. Immediately he says, you know, in case you understand it wrongly, he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Moderation. It talks about self-restraint. Talks about self-discipline. Not an uncontrolled, runaway life. But a life that is totally given to God. And the life can say, I am happy in the Lord. It is enough for me to have my Lord. It is enough for me to know God's word. It's enough for me to live according to God's word. I'm willing to give up everything and anything that will be against my Lord. I will not be in any circumstances where the Lord is not pleased with me. So you see, the joy that Apostle Paul teaches us is intrinsically related or based upon the Lord himself. There is no joy for Christian apart from the Lord. You know, if you are, have a tendency to rejoice in things that are contrary to Christ, then I tell you, you are sinning. No joy outside the Lord for you and me. We don't want the joy that doesn't please God because our calling as our reform, reform fathers have very clearly put it is to enjoy Him forever. Not enjoy the world forever. You know, sometimes when people go for holiday, we try to tell them, hey, enjoy, all right? Have a good time. <sighs> Nowadays when people say all this, I'm very scared. You better say, enjoy the Lord when you're away. Take time to think all things in the light of God's word. You better preach a sermon. <laughs> Rather than just say, hey, go enjoy yourself. See you. Have a good time. Boy, you know what this world means, good time? It's a really bad time. Very bad time. Full of sin and, and wickedness and, and, ah, talk about it. The biblical command, rejoice in the Lord. And we got to rejoice, and that's for sure. You see, Christians cannot be unhappy about the Christian life. Christians cannot be unhappy about Christ. Christians cannot be unhappy about serving Christ. 
when it comes to obeying the Lord and serving the Lord and worshipping Him and mutually doing the duties for Christ's sake as the head of the church commands us to help one another and to be edifying to one another, we cannot afford to be bitter about it. <laughs> no. We must say, praise God. Even if it's against our feelings, even if it's against our our ideas and desires, we got to say, thank you, Lord, for telling me. Even though I'm not so willing, yet you have not despised me, you have not asked me to leave, you asked me to come and serve. Thank you. Our mutual duties and our duties toward God are not natural to us. I said that a while ago, isn't it? Naturally, we don't like to budge to the things of God. We don't want to yield. And so we feel irritated at times. But remember, you cannot be irritated when it comes to the things of the Lord. Even though it's against what your natural man would desire, you must yield because you know the Lord is calling you to do it. And you must thank Him for that. I may be lazy and I want to prepare well. Just want to sleep and don't want to think about it and don't want to preach and rather go home and rest and recover. But the Lord says, rise up and go and preach. I cannot say, oh, ah, yeah. uh, Then I come here and preach a very shabbily, shabbily prepared uh, message and you are not edified. You know how unthankful I am, how unhappy I am. And it affects you, your joy also go away. You won't have that joy in the Lord when you come to worship. You know, it's very easy for me to send you away with dissatisfaction. I mean, spiritual dissatisfaction. If I have to think about my own pleasure, you will not be edified. You will not be strengthened. You will not be spiritually fed. If you are unhappy to minister to me and other brethren in the church, you know, many of us will go away having this struggle. So it's very important you must be joyful, irrespective of your struggles. That's why it's a command. The, the, you know, there are some prayers and some songs that sometimes disturb me quite a bit, really. Because it is like uh, the Lord is not giving us the joy. Uh, we pray, Lord, give me the joy. There's nothing wrong in praying, Lord, give me the joy, if it means that, Lord, you have actually provided everything for my joy, but I've not been taking it. Now make me wise to think of those things as really joyful. Don't pray, give me joy, as though God never wanted you to be joy, and he forgot about giving you joy, and he went somewhere else forgetting you, and now you have to call him and say, hey, turn around this way, Lord, give me some joy, okay? Don't go away without giving me joy. Now, that sort of prayer is not right. And we sing a song, make me a servant. Every time when people sing that song, I say, oh, when did the Lord say, I'm not going to make you a servant? Why keep on singing, make me a servant? You are a servant if you're a Christian. You just say, Lord, give me the power to continue my duty as a servant. The moment you become a Christian, you are a servant, okay? No need to make you a servant. It's just that you are not willing to be a servant. But is it totally wrong to say make a servant? Also not. Because you are just saying, Lord, I've been a servant. I want to be more of a servant. Give me more work to do. If that's the idea, then it's okay. But the problem is that people often, you know, say things as though it's God's fault. I'm not happy. Why? No, God. God is God. See? If God is loving me, how come my life is like this? So God don't want to give you joy. Many people talk to God or talk about God as though God is a joy killer. He takes away my joy. And then we talk like that. We are saying, oh, actually, I've been living the joy all this time. Now God took it away. <laughs> you have no joy in yourself. You are a desperate sinner. All the glory of God has departed from you because of your sin. It is God who has given you joy. Now, you see, this sort of thinking is not only uh, 
misunderstanding of the scripture or uh, misapplication of the scripture, it is also extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Let me show you this. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 10. Let's go there. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 10. Look at the words of Paul concerning his own experience. What does he say? As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. You may say, how can you make somebody rich when you are so poor? It's possible for Christians. I may have no money. But if I give you good counsels of God, the Lord may turn around your fortune and bless you. I don't have to have money to make you rich. I can go on my knees and pray for you. So in your poverty, the Lord may bless you. I'm talking physically, but it's also true spiritually. And the Lord here says through Paul to all of us, very clearly, as sorrowful, Yet always rejoicing. You know, Apostle Paul was saying, you know, my life as a Christian is not without trouble. I had many occasions of tears. I have many occasions of conflict in my heart. I've been dishonored. I've been shamed. I've been made naked. I've been made starve, I've been made suffer pain of death, I've been left alone, I've been hated by people outside the church, and there were also false brethren who accused me falsely, some call him a false apostle, some said get him out, don't receive him, there were so many, so many unthinkable experiences of excruciating pain. It cut through him. So Paul says, yep, yeah, it's true. In a human perspective, Christian life is a Christian life of contradicting experiences at the same time. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I am afraid, I shall trust him. When I am sad, I shall rejoice. When I am poor, I shall make others rich. Only in the Bible you have a recipe for it. As sorrowful, it always rejoices. We have no reason to say, oh, I don't have this, so I'm not going to rejoice. I don't have what others have, so I'm not going to rejoice. I am sick, so I refuse to be comforted. No, don't say that. You better say this. I'm poor, but the Lord is going to give me the joy that tells me there is something greater than wealth. I'm sick, but God is going to make me happy. And that would teach me there are greater experiences than being healthy. I'm full of fear because people intimidate me and, and uh, threaten me. But I'm going to look to my Lord and find my strength in Him because the Lord says, I'm your refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble. My Lord is in my trouble and I'm going to have him. If they throw me into lions, then I'm not going to scream and shout and say, oh, don't. I would rather go to the lion's den and see my Lord there. If they throw me into fire, I will go into that extremely painful, flaming experience and I shall meet the Son of God there. If it's a stormy wind, it's a stormy sea, that the Lord want me to go through. 
If it is flood, if it is blood, then I will go through with my Lord. He will be with me. I'm in Him. Nothing of these things would ever take me out of the love of God. You remember those wonderful sayings of Apostle Paul in Romans concerning the experience of Christians? Listen, you are not unfamiliar with this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things, in all these things, all these opposing, conflicting, harrowing experiences, he says, in all these things we are, what? More than conquerors through Christ who loved us. You are a conqueror. How do you show that you are a conqueror? If there is no sadness, if there is no conflict. You are rich when you are poor. I don't, I am not now saying about physical matters. You can be very poor, but you can be so rich in the presence of God, even a rich man, a billionaire, will feel ashamed in your presence. Sometimes people ask me, I say this for the glory of God, Pastor Kushi, how do you manage all these ministries? You know, nowadays people from other churches and places will pick up our 25th anniversary magazine and read through and they are amazed and they ask, you know, our church is bigger than your church, but don't do all these things. How do you manage? Where do you find the time? Where do you, do you sleep? They asked me all kinds of questions. Even last two weeks when I was away in a retreat of another BP church, they asked me the same question. I said, can you tell us how? You are diabetic. You are tired. You always look sick. How do you manage? Huh. It's not me who manage. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. You know, I don't say I want a sabbatical leave for the next 10 years until I recuperate. I always have my Sabbath in the Lord. When I'm busy, I rest in God. When I'm sick, I lean upon His everlasting arms. When I'm, my mind is so stressed and pressurized, I go to Him in His presence and think of His sweet counsels. When I feel lethargic and, and lazy, I remember his stirring words, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding. And I jump out of my bed and I go and do my work. In my Lord, I am more than a conqueror and therefore my joy complete. Rejoice evermore. In the Lord. Now remember, it is always rejoice, evermore rejoice. The emphasis is never let your heart ever forsake the joy that is in the Lord. So seek Him always, be in His presence always, do His will always, always. Always, boys and girls, if you are in some kind of relationship, which we call BGR, hoping to get married, maintain your BGR in the Lord, then your relationship will be happy. Otherwise, it will be quarrel and fighting and tears and heartbreak and don't know what. Then the girl will say, I'll never trust a man again. And the girl, man will say, oh, all the ladies are like that. Never trust them. All sort of rubbish, you know. Because you conducted yourself outside the Lord. That's why you are like that. Husbands and wives. 
This is not a competition to show who is better than the other. Your marriage life is to do God's will, not your will. If you do your part with wholehearted commitment, joy will fill your marriage life. I'm not saying there won't be trouble. I'm not saying there will be plenty of money. No, no, no. All these things come, but you can be poor and that rich in the presence of God and in His joy. Pastors, elders, deacons, we want peace and joy in our service to God in the session and board of elders. You know how to have it? Not that we show off our degrees and achievements and worldly accolades. We come to do His will. And we shall be united with the same mind in the Lord and our joy will be complete. Whoever you are, a businessman, a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, a farmer, a road sweeper, a student, a petrol pump attendant, an engineer, whatever you be, do it all in the Lord and the joy of the Lord shall be your portion. Let's pray. as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. What, what an experience. The world will say you can have peace when all your troubles are gone, when wars are stopped, when wars and rumors of wars are completely resolved, then we will have peace. The businessman would say, when I am rich and all my plans have been accomplished and I gather more money than I ever imagined, then I shall have joy. The king shall say, when nobody revolts against me, when everything is settled, when all things are under my control and I will be the disputed, undisputed king, then I shall have joy. Children would say, only when I'm allowed to live the way I want to live, then I shall have joy. But we know, Lord, nobody finds such joy in this world. And that you have told us that you will give your joy. You told us in this world there will be tribulation, but let not, let not your heart be troubled. So, Lord, we ask for this joy, the joy to walk with thee, the joy to abide in thee, the joy and the perfect contentment of the Lord's presence and of his will. And thus, each one of us may find that perfect relationship, that unbroken relationship with God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit whose fruit is joy, love and peace, and more. And today we learn that it is the joy of the Holy Ghost that we are given, the joy of the Lord through the Holy Ghost. May we walk in the Spirit, in His Word, that the joy may be complete within us. Bless thy people and bless us all to rejoice today in the, in the Lord and in the company of all those who follow the Lord. And may this church be a company of pilgrims walking away from the world and to Christ and his heaven. May this church have that joy. And let all those who are heaven bound come, we pray. And they also find the portion of joy with us in the Lord. In Jesus' name, we give thee thanks and pray. Amen. <laughs>